In this video, I'm going to focus on the B-cell immunodeficiencies. If you want more information on primary immunodeficiencies in general, there's a primary immunodeficiency overview video. In that video, I cover things like the symptoms, the incidence, um, of various immunodeficiencies. And that can kind of explain to you what you might be looking for in these kids. Um, in this case, we're literally only talking about immunodeficiencies in the B cell compartment. So in the B cell compartment, that could be a lack of all B cells, or it could be a lack of a certain isotype, like for example, IgA immunodeficiency, or it could be an overexpression of a certain isotype, like hyper IgM. So before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how B cells development develop, because all of these are all of these immunodeficiencies are basically a breakdown in this process at some point. OK, so let's just go over a couple ground rules. B cells are generally characterized by the presence of surface immunoglobulin. These surface immunoglobulins act as the B cell receptor. OK. In the development of B cells, immature B cells develop in the bone marrow. They develop out of the common lymphoid progenitor cell. This is the same progenitor cell that is used for T cell development, except T cell development moves from the bone marrow into the thymus, whereas bone B cells complete their development within the bone marrow. Pre-B cells, which can be found here, will have already rearranged their heavy chain. So if you remember the structure of your antibody or immunoglobulin. This one over here, this is your heavy chain, okay? And this is your light chain. The heavy chain that is always first made is an IgM heavy chain, which then serves as the initial B cell receptor. When it's a large pre-B cell, it has created the heavy chain protein, which is expressed inside an endosome, before it is paired with the V pre-B surrogate receptor to test if that heavy chain is functional. At that point, it'll be expressed on the surface and the cell will proliferate. Once it's made its light chain, it has a full IgM on its surface that can be either CAPTA or lambda light chain, and then it will undergo alternative splicing to express the IgD heavy chain at the same time as the IgM. This basically signals to the bone marrow that it's ready to leave the bone marrow and can go out into the periphery to find its antigen of interest. Now, once it does that, in response to antigen, it's going to undergo a terminal differentiation to a plasma cell. Plasma cells are what secrete antibodies, right? So something like IgG or even IgM. If it wants to get to IgG, it's going to need T cell help, and that T cell comes from CD4 positive helper cells in the form of cytokines. Um, this happens when you have CD40 ligand on the CD4 positive T cell binding to CD40 on the B cell, and that's basically what tells the B cell to turn on AID. AID allows for class switching, which basically stops production of IgM and IgD, and begins production of IgG. So I'm showing here very crudely. Okay, so that's kind of the overwhelming theme of how we get B cells. So where could we go wrong? So many places. So really, when you have a breakdown in B cell immuno or in B cell immunity, what we're talking about is as the main readout is a concept known as hypogamma globulinemia. This is basically defined just as antibody deficiency. Patients with hypogamma globulinemia typically have sinopulmonary infections, i.e. sinus infections. This would be things like sinusitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, and otitis media, like ear infections. Um, typically, these are due to encapsulated bacteria, the same infections that typically cause these things. So this would be things like your streps, certainly strep pyogenes and strep pneumoniae, but also we need to worry about things like Haemophilus influenza. Um, there is a vaccine for Hib Haemophilus influenza type B, but there are other Haemophilus influenza strains that can lead to these symptoms. Other symptoms that we see are things like conjunctivitis, dermatitis, and a malabsorption issue. Um, this is often, the malabsorption is actually often associated with infection with Giardia um, or other protozoa. Other things you might see in these kiddos are things like meningitis, um, septicemia. Think about it, 
some of these infections that I've named, uh, particularly strep pneumo and strep pyogenes, are really great at causing sepsis. Um, osteomyelitis might, might occur. It's a little bit less common in um, these kiddos, um, but it can occur. In a few patients with hypogamma globulinemia, especially the X-linked infantile form, viral infections, so if we're talking X-linked, viral infections with like enterococci, or sorry, enterovirus, it's a virus infection, enteroviruses, um, like polio, or the echoviruses, these are all things that you might worry about. Same goes for hepatitis and pneumocystis gyrovecchiae. Um, all of these have been reported. There also appears to be a unique susceptibility to mycoplasma and urea plasma species. So there may be autoimmunity or decreased malignancies in some forms of antibody deficiency as well. So all sorts of things to look out for. So how can you diagnose it since we know there's all these problems, but they're kind of nonspecific problems, right? Like they're just infections that sometimes kids get. If you're a parent, your kid's gonna get ear infections all the time. Are you supposed to worry that they have hypogamma globulinemia all the time because they've had five ear infections? Probably not. So what's a good way of kind of ruling this in or ruling this out? So first off, we have screening tests. Your screening tests are things that test for B cell function. And they include a quantitative immunoglobulin test, which basically measures the serum level of the different isotypes, IgG, IgA, IgM, and sometimes IgE, depending. Um, and this is basically looking um, for normal values, which vary by age. So you would actually test based on the age of the patient. The other thing you can do is an isohemagglutinin titer. So remember, your isohemagglutinins actually have to do with your blood type, all right? So let's do kind of a quick review on blood type, all right? So I'm type O, I'm OO. Um, and my husband is A. I don't know if he's AO or AA, but he's type A. So let's just for sake of it, go say type AA. Um, our son is type A. So he's likely AO, okay? So that means I have isohemagglutinins that are against A blood and B blood. My husband has isohemagglutinins against B, and Ryan, our son, has isohemagglutinins against B as well, okay? So the whole point here is basically that we made these antibodies against bacteria that are found in our gastrointestinal tract. And the reason is that these antibodies are basically similar in structure to the carbohydrate lip or carbohydrate ligands or antigens, sorry, that are found on our blood types, okay? So everybody forms them, it's totally normal. So if we were suspecting somebody with type A blood to have an immunodeficiency in their hypo in their um, isotypes, what you would do is you'd say, okay, how many antibodies do they have that are anti-type B? Okay, because it would be normal at this child's age for them to have a fairly high titer. So it basically is an indication of IgM function. So children that are greater than one year old should have a titer of a greater than or equal to one to four. And if they don't, that's an indicator that their IgM isn't functioning correctly. Now, you also have some definitive tests here. Um, you can do a B-cell quanti quantitation. This is just a measurement of the circulating B-cells by number, um, and it's normally done by flow. Normal values are about 5 to 15% of total lymph lymphocytes. You can do a specific antibody measurement. Um, this measures for an increase in antibody following vaccination or immunization um, with different protein antigens. Common ones that are used are things like tetanus or diphtheria, where you should make a um, antigen response. Um, you can also use a pneumococcal vaccine for polysaccharide antigens, things like that. You can also do an in vitro immunoglobulin synthesis. This is really more of a research technique than a diagnostic technique, and it basically studies T helper and regulatory effects on immunoglobulin synthesis or B cell function in vitro. This one would likely be more important if you were worried about a combined immunodeficiency than if you were worried about a straight B cell immunodeficiency. Okay, 
So let's get on with some of the more important of the B-cell immunodeficiencies. I think this by far is probably the most important of the B-cell immunodeficiencies for you to know. It's known as X-linked agamma globulinemia, or XLA. Sometimes it's referred to as BTK deficiency, or Bruton's tyrosine kinase agamma globulinemia. Same thing. Basically, in 1952, this guy Bruton described the first boy with this X-linked syndrome. Clinically, patients with this have some of the same things I talked about earlier. Um, recurrent sinopulmonary infections, conjunctivitis, dermatitis, malabsorption. Often the onset is somewhere between five and six months of age. So on physical exam, the other thing to know is that you normally can't find lymph nodes. You won't be able to palpate them. Why? Because they're just not full enough. They're not big enough without the B cells. So where does this one take place? Basically, you make your heavy chain in the pre-B cell stage, right? We talked about that earlier. In order to transition from pre-B cell to basically B cell, right, where you've made your light chain, you need to turn on a tyrosine kinase that is now known as BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And if you are deficient in that, you can't ever move from having a heavy chain to having a heavy chain and a light chain. So you never make this leap, all right? Um, so typically with Bruton's tyrosine kinase, you're going to not be able to identify any circulating mature B cells. They basically stall out and you're not gonna therefore find any plasma cells. You'll find some pre-B cells and when you find them, they're likely going to have a cytoplasmic mu heavy chain because they can't move from making their heavy chain to making their light chain. So basically the main study is gonna show you that you're gonna have markedly reduced immunoglobulins. So less than 200 milligrams per deciliter total of IgG um, and less than 250 immunoglobulins per deciliter of all of them. Um, and you're either gonna have IgA, you're basically going to have all of the immunoglobulins very low or completely absent. That's pretty much the whole issue. Um, I should say, um, Dr. Jones talks about this one a lot in her information, um, but the genetic uh, defect is actually linked to an X chromosome at position Q22. So it's also sometimes known as XQ22 deficiency. Um, but really all that does is delete the BTK genes. Um, for this one, there really isn't a lot we can do for it. Um, you can give antibiotics, intravenous gamma globulin, and chest physiotherapy. Okay, now here's the weird thing. Hypogamma gamma globulinemia is actually kind of normal. So if you think about immunoglobulin levels in patients, you need to think about them on an age spectrum. When we're born, we actually don't have really any of our own immuno, immunoglobulins, okay? We have moms, we have maternal IgG, and we actually have a full complement of that at birth. But then over time, over the first six months, that maternal IgG tanks. And it's actually going to take a couple months for us to make a full complement of it. So you can see, even at a year, we're only at 80% the adult level of normal IgG, okay? IgM, we start making that at about six months, right? Or sorry, we start making that at about, you know, about the time we're born. But by the time we hit a year, we're still only at 75% the adult level. IgA, we start making that about two months after birth. And at a year, we're still only at 20% the adult level. So this is one of those reasons why there's whole that, that whole um, breast is best campaign um, because uh, breast milk will actually provide IgA to the infant to help bump up these IgA levels. Because you can see that one stays pretty low. Um, so it is actually normal for infants, particularly in that like, four to 10 month time period to be a little bit hypogamma globulinemic. Um, that's not all that strange. Um, so it's normal to have this low percentage. Um, premature infants are especially prone to kind of a more prolonged physiologic hypogamma globulinemia, um, just because they don't have enough time to get the full 
um, complement. Now, that said, there is hypogammaglobulinemia of infancy that is a little bit abnormal, okay? And that's transient hypogammaglobulinemia of infancy. Um, clinically, it's typically asymptomatic, but if you diagnose it, you're just gonna see that the levels are all a little bit low. Um, this disorder actually can be um, differentiated from XLA. One, because it occurs in both sexes, right? Um, two, because you do actually see um, you, you see the isotypes come up, it's just gonna take a little while. So you're gonna keep checking every three to four months. Um, IgM and IgA are often normal. So that's another way to differentiate it from XLA. IgG is pretty low. You're gonna see circulating B cells, which is a good sign that the patient doesn't have XLA. And basically the only thing you can say is wait it out, it'll get better. Um, a few patients with this will have some recurrent respiratory infections with an onset at about five to six months of age. Some possible etiologies include things like transplacental maternal antibodies against fetal allotypic determinants or a lack of helper cells. So that could basically lead to a more prolonged hypogammaglobulinemic um, period in the infant. Um, if you do need to treat the patient, um, you should first check the quantitative immunoglobulins every three to four months, and you can give gamma globulin replacement if the patient is having really severe infections. All right, common variable immunodeficiency. This variable syndrome of acquired hypogammaglobulinemia affects both sexes, and it actually shows up later in life, like really later in life, like 15 to 40 years of age is actually the most common, okay? Um, it can occur earlier and even later. This is just kind of, you know, your ballpark. Um, the incidence of CVID is not exactly known, but it's estimated to be in about one to 30,000 to one to 50,000 um, individuals. Um, but it's underdiagnosed and delay in diagnosis is common, okay? Um, so what do the laboratory studies reveal if we're looking for this? Okay, first off, you're going to see low IgG, again, based on age, and a lower um, total immunoglobulin route. Um, typically, IgA and IgM are low, present, but low. Um, in order to actually make a definitive diagnosis, you need to have a decrease in two of the three major isotypes. The B cells are going to be present, but patients are unable to make specific antibody in response to an immunization or the isohemagglutinin titers are low to absent. So basically, yes, the B cells are there, but they're kind of not doing their job. Um, the T cell function might be normal, but some patients up to like 40% also have a mildly reduced T cell function initially, which may deteriorate with time. We don't really know what causes this. Um, there's an association with certain mutations, um, TASI in close to 10% of patients. There's also associations with um, mutations in the genes that encode CD19, CD21, and CD81. Um, as well as ICOS, um, all of these have been associated, associated with CVID, but they're pretty rare. Um, typically, patients, we're talking about the same thing over and over, sinopulmonary infections, increased risk of autoimmunity and malignancy for which the patients may require follow-up um, treatment. You can give them IV IG um, if you really need it, if they're having a lot of severe infections frequent monitoring for the development of autoimmune disease and malignancy. Okay, selective IgA deficiency. So we go from some stuff that's kind of severe to something that kind of isn't. This is the most common. It occurs in one in 700 live births. Um, the lowest number I've seen is one in 400, so it's not all that uncommon. It affects both men and women with variable inheritance. Really, it's typically asymptomatic. You're gonna see a couple sinopulmonary infections, higher incidence of allergies and asthma, um, gastrointestinal issues, and autoimmunity. There really isn't any treatment because like I said before, it's largely asymptomatic. You just kind of manage the infections as they come. And obviously, if the patient develops an autoimmunity, they'd seek treatment for that. Um, how can you diagnose it? You've got low IgA. That's pretty much it. Everything else is normal. The other immunoglobulins are there. The T cells are functioning. Um, the one thing I'll note is that like, if you have a patient that you and the patient are 90% sure they have celiac, you might check their IgA if their celiac test is negative. Because often patients with IgA deficiency 
do have these increased GI disorder issues. So they start believing they're celiac. You check for celiac, the celiac is negative, and kind of your first instinct is it's not celiac. So, you know, eat better. I don't know what to tell you. And it probably isn't celiac, but it could be IgA deficiency because that one's actually pretty common. Um, there's no direct treatment. There have been anaphylactic reactions to gamma globulin reported, presumably due to antibodies against the traces of IgA found in gamma globulin. Um, so, you know, use that with caution. Um, IgA deficient patients who require transfusions may need to receive either washed, packed red blood cells or blood from another IgA deficient patient with the same blood type if their IgA levels are undetectable, just to avoid kind of like a serum sickness phenomenon. Um, antibiotics should be used aggressively to treat infections because particularly, you guys know I love IgA, IgA is really important for a lot of these infections and it's helping us kind of get rid of some of these path pathogens. So if we're lacking this function, then we can't do it. Um, patients should also be monitored for development of autoimmune disorders. Okay, hyper-IgM. We talked about this one a lot when we talked about developing um, B cells and T cells. This is a fairly rare X-linked disease in which class switching to IgG, IgA, or IgE just doesn't happen. It's pretty rare. Um, basically, you get recurrent bacterial infections. There is a higher susceptibility for pneumocystis gyrovecchiae in these patients. So, First off, when you go to kind of assess this patient, you're gonna see really high levels of IgM. And then you're gonna see really low levels of IgG or IgA. This is weird, right? Because normally you get IgM at first, and then a couple weeks later, IgG takes over. And then if you were to do a repeat immunization, we should see IgG peak even more and very little IgM. These patients have the opposite. Why? They can't get to IgG. And it's not even the B cell's fault. Remember that when a B cell and a T cell interact, right? The B cell presents the antigen to the T cell. The T cell says thanks and gives the B cell some cytokines, right? And we've got our co-stimulation here, so our B7 and our CD28, right? And all is going well. Then we've CD40 and CD40 ligand, okay? So the T cell is supposed to give them CD40 ligand. And that basically is what turns on when it's bound to CD40 on the B cell, AID in the B cell, which leads to class switching. Well, here's the problem. The T cells in patients with hyper IgM, they don't express CD40 ligand. It's an entire failure of the T cell that affects the B cell compartment. Um, so basically it results in a failure to deliver the class switching signal. And so that means you don't class switch, you don't get B cell memory, and you don't get affinity maturation. All of these things knocked out. You also lose a lot of germinal centers where these B cell events would occur. Um, there's an autosomal hyper IgM syndrome, which are due to mutations in other genes involved in class switching, things like AID or CD40 or NEMO, um, but this by far is the most common. Um, typically, this one affects boys. Boys have a much higher rate because um, why? It's excellent. Um, IgM autoantibodies against blood elements such as red cells and platelets do develop. Um, and patients present with recurrent bacterial infections, including um, earaches, pneumonia, and septicemia, and that increased inc incidence of pneumocystis gyrovecchiae. Um, how can we treat it? Well, you kind of can't, but if you need to, you could give infusions of Ig. Um, you can also give prophylactic treatment for pneumocystis um, because that's a real nasty bug. So we want to make sure that we avoid um, infections with that in these patients. Um, you can do that by treating with Bactrim. Um, and then in rare instances, a bone marrow transplant may be performed to establish a normal immune system if a patient is really getting a lot of severe infections over and over and over again. Okay, two other... Um, B cell immunodeficiencies. We're not gonna go into nearly the detail here. So you can have a selective IgM immunodeficiency. This is an autosomal disorder in which there are normal numbers of IgM bearing B cells, which are unable to develop into plasma cells. So basically this is no plasma cells. If you don't get plasma cells, you can't make antibodies. So you have the B cells, they're just not making antibodies. Okay, 
Um, the other one is X-linked ectodermal dysplasia with immunodeficiency. This again, it's an X-linked disorder that has a mutation in NEMO. We didn't really talk about NEMO. This is um, uh, an NF-kepa-B essential modulator. It basically disrupts the activation pathway that's required for both innate and adaptive immunity. So this is kind of a combined immunodeficiency, right? Patients are unable to make specific antibody and demonstrate hypogammaglobulinemia. Patients with this ectodermal dysplasia have thickened skin, conical teeth, an absence of sweat glands, and thin hair. They also get infections with pus-inducing or pyogenic organisms like pneumococcus and staphylococcus, and those are the most common. So that's all of the B cell deficiencies. The ones I'd focus on the most are XLA, IgA, and um, hyper IgM. Those are your big ones that people tend to think of the most when they wanna talk to you about how B cells development develop and how it goes wrong.